FC. I need to make myself very clear. If we uplink now, Skynet will be in control of your military. But you'll be in control of Skynet, right? That is correct, sir. Skynet. Skynet. Does anyone need to use the repeater before we begin the 9 p.m. Skynet?
uh, Star Little Lake. Give me a couple of minutes to figure out what's going on. This is KE5ICX. Five ICX test. Does anyone need to use the repeater before we begin the 9 p.m. Skynet? E5 ICX test. Does anyone need to use the repeater before you begin the 9 p.m. Skynet? This is KF5PDS. My name is Billy, and I'll be your net control for this session of the DARC Skynet. Skynet is a weekly net called every Saturday night at 9 p.m. concerning the subject of astronomy. Our purpose is to help amateurs become more familiar with the nighttime and daytime sky, astronomy, and space in general. This net is open to all amateurs interested in this topic, and we encourage your participation, comments, and suggestions for this net. Stations with priority or emergency traffic may enter the net at any time by using the pro sign, break, break, and your call sign. Is there any emergency or priority traffic? This is a directed net. Please do not transmit without direction from net control. That would be me. And stations are reminded to ID at the end of your transmissions. This weekly net operates on 146.880 megahertz with a PL tone of 110.9. Check-ins via echo link are also possible using the W5FC-R station ID or echo link node 37247. Tonight's topics, astronomy charts, pictures and live audio video links are available online. Go to www.w5fc.org right now for the complete list and remember to tell others about this popular net. All amateur operators are welcome. You need not be a member of any amateur radio club to participate. This net is 90 minutes long and is structured in several parts. General announcements, Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas events, where and when you can look through a telescope, National Space Society events, discussion topic of the evening, what can you see in the sky tonight, a featured constellation or object or topic, recent astronomical discoveries, space exploration and space history, visible satellite passages over the next couple of days, astronomical Q&A, and our 73 round. 
time permitting, we'll get to all these parts, hopefully. If not, we may have to skip some. Uh, all amateur uh, licensed to transmit on this frequency are invited to check in. So at this time, I'll turn the net over to my alternate net control, KE5ICX, if you will do the check-in honors, please. And thank you, Ms. Billy. This is KE5ICX of the alternate net control this evening for tonight's Skynet. We'll go ahead and take low-power short-time check-ins. If you'd like to join us, please come now with your call sign, your name. If you would, give me your location. Let me know if you're low and or low-power and or short-time. Please come now. November 5, Sierra, Quebec Alpha, low power. Number Tango 5, Tango Mike, Tony, low power portable in Dallas. Let's go ahead and get those ch folks checked in. I'm going to need a fill here on one. We have N5SQA, Ron, low power in Dallas. NT5TM, Tony, low power portable in Dallas. The next station after that, uh, you were very low audio and lots of noise. If you could increase power a little bit, I'm going to turn up the volume uh, to 11. So uh, if you'd like to try again, the station after Tony, please try again. I think you're portable. Hello, Foxtrot 5, Quebec, Delta, Quebec, Eric in Garland, Portable. Excellent. I got you that time, Eric. KF5 QDQ, Eric over in Garland. Much, much better. Next was KF5 BBQ, Ray in Ulysses, your short time. I'll take additional low power short time check ins and then ask if you've got anything for us for the net. Low power short time, please come down. Hi, Golf Uniform Sierra Gus for Northeast Dallas. Low power, nothing for the net. Very good. I'll just go ahead and take those. Uh, anyone who has checked in low power short time, do you have anything for the net that you would like to bring now? Please come with your call sign. November Tango 5, Tango Mike. Foxtrot 5, Quebec Delta, Quebec. Very good. I think this is the first time this has ever happened, but we always make a pause for it. NT5TM and K5QDQ. Uh, um, Eric, I've got you both. So, Tony, NT5TM, go ahead. Thank you, everyone. I do have a couple quick announcements. I'd like to remind everyone that this is not our last net of the night. There is an Afterglow movie net tonight at 10.30 p.m., and I know Tom will have more to say about it. We also do have a GeekNet coming up this Monday. I'm going to propose that we have a topic of invasive and annoying species. Uh, little things that bother you or that have invaded your yard or that have invaded the country. 
Uh, if you'd like to talk about them, we're going to geek out about them this Monday on this report at 7 p.m. And, of course, we do have lots more announcements. Please have a look at W5FC.org. And remember that field day is at Flagpole Hill coming up soon. NT5TM. Very good. Thank you, Tony. Anybody need any fills? Come now. Next up, KF5QDQ, Eric over in Garland. What do you have for us this evening? Just a reminder that the Rockwall Shores on the uh, Shores on the Rock Rockwall Star Party was canceled for today uh, due to weather. Uh, that was a shame, really, because it's nice and clear tonight. Uh, I'm out on my driveway with my big 8-inch dob, and the seeing is wonderful if you just work your way around the moon, unless you want to look at the moon, in which case it looks really good, too. Uh, that's all for now. KF5 QDQ, back to my portable, and listening in. Very good. Thank you, Eric. And by the way, you're welcome to break in any time in the net. You got something there you want to tell us about? By all means, we know you're out there. And we've always asked at times if, uh, at the events if uh, somebody would like to report in, but uh, it's always difficult because there's a, a crowd out there as well, and they come first, as always, and always should. So if you see something out there or you got something to say, uh, bring it on because we'd like to know. And this is KE5 ICX net control, or alternate net control for tonight's Skynet. I'm going to go ahead and take general check-ins now. These are RF only. I'll take a link in a moment. If you'd like to join us, please come now with your call sign, name, and where you're transmitting from. Please come now. This is November 5, Bravo, Bravo. Bill, interrupting. Echo 5, Zulu Yankee, Oscar, J in Dallas. Echo 5, Alpha, November, Papa, Allen in Dallas. This is... November 5, Whiskey, Oscar, India, William, and Allen. This is... Whiskey Bravo 5, Oscar Zulu Lima, Brenda and DeSoto. This is Kilo Charlie 5, Oscar Zulu Tango, Carolyn and Louisville. Kilo Golf 5, Oscar Quebec Kilo, Dave and Garland. Foxtrot 5, Tango, Sierra Kilo, Burl, and Dallas. Oh, Foxtrot 5, Zulu, Bravo, Lima, Bill, Thomas Ranch. Oh, 5, Kilo, Tango, X ray, Kelly, in Quinlan. Let's go ahead and hold up their uh, healthy check-ins all. Let me see. We have, I am going to need a fill, so hopefully you'll recognize before and after. Uh, let's see. We've got N5BB, Mr. Bill over in Irving, K, uh, KE5ZYO, J in Dallas, K5ANP, Allen in Dallas, N5WOI, William in Allen, WB5OZL, Miss Brenda DeSoto, KC5OZT, Miss Carolyn Lewisville, KG5OQK, Dave in Garland. Now, there's an, a station um, that came in. There was nothing but a 60-cycle hum. It was strong. If you have, uh, say, a portable radio and it is plugged into an outlet, 
unplug it and try again. I think it's you. So it's uh, something unusual there that you've got set up. I uh, get a 60 cycle hum. So I'm going to see if that station is there. If not, you do not hear your call. We can get you on the next round. So uh, one more time for the 60 cycle station. Whiskey 5, Echo Bravo Bravo, David and Dallas. That was my fusion reactor I'm testing out. 75 dBb. Uh, usually people don't admit, but I've done that more than once. Uh, W5EVB, David, in Dallas. K5, TSK, Burrow in Dallas. K5, ZBL, Mr. Bill in Farmer's Branch. K5, KTX, Miss Kelly in Quinlan. Additional check-ins, please come now. hearing none. There's plenty of opportunities later on uh, to get check-in. We'll do check-ins every uh, few minutes or every 20 minutes or so. So I'm going to go to Echolink. I'm going to give you extra time. If you're on Echolink, would like to join us, please come with your call sign name and let us know where you are, your QTH, your home location is. Please come now. Echolink only. Kilo Golf 5, Bravo Zulu Whiskey, uh, Jay near Weatherford with uh, Cat Roscoe. We'll take KG5BZWJ over in Weatherford. All right, uh, we'll do additional check-ins later on, so I'm going to turn it back to net control. So, uh, this is Billy, KF5PDS, this is KE5ICX, we're up to 19 check-ins. Back to you. Great. Well, thank you very much. And copy that we have 19 check-ins. So welcome to everybody who's joined us for Skynet. And welcome, Roscoe. Even though you're not a licensed ham, we enjoy you listening in. My pumpkin here says, what up, Roscoe? All right. So glad to see you. We've got our feline uh, population represented tonight on Skynet. Okay. Uh, before we start tonight's net, uh, uh, go to announcements. I have an important uh, and sad announcement to make of my own. So it is with great sadness that I announce the passing of Apollo Moonwalker, Skylab Commander, and lunar artist Alan Bean, who passed away today in Houston, Texas at the age of 86 after a sudden onset of illness. Kelly K5KTX will bring more information about his remarkable life and career later on in the program. But I wanted to begin tonight's net with one minute of silence to honor and remember this extraordinary man. We thank you for your bravery to explore our cosmos, to walk on another world, and inspire others by sharing the story of your amazing journey with others. We will never forget you, sir. So at this time, I would like to honor Alan Bean with a full minute of silence, which I will time. So. Uh, if all transmissions will please refrain for the next minute of silence to honor Apollo astronaut Alan Bean.
This is KF5PDS, your net control for this evening's edition of Skynet. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I know we've already had some announcements uh, from some stations, but if there's anyone else that has any general announcements for this evening's net, these can be ham, astronomical, space, or of general interest to licensed hams. If anyone else has any announcements, uh, please come now with your call sign. K5 KTX. K5 KTX. Good evening, Kelly. What announcements do you have for us this evening? This is K5 KTX. And I want to make sure everybody puts this date in their calendar now because it's coming up very soon. But on Saturday, July the 21st, the Frontiers of Flight Museum will, will be hosting its annual Moon Day, the biggest annual space exposition in Texas. Moon Day honors previous space flight accomplishments and focuses on current and future activities in space exploration. This year, the STEM-focused event also celebrates the upcoming 50th anniversary of the Apollo 7 mission and includes programs and classes for all ages. Moon Day is presented in collaboration with the National Space Society of North Texas. And guess who's coming this year? Uh, we have two awesome uh, folks that are coming. First, Army Colonel Doug Wheels Wheelock is a NASA astronaut who spent over 178 days in space. And pilot Wally Funk was a member of the Mercury 13 from the 1960s to determine if women were suitable for space and has accumulated over 18,000 hours of flight time. So this is going to be a great event as it is every year. And of course, you can go to the Frontiers of Flight Museum website and um, look for the Moon Day event and get all the details. So again, Saturday, July the 21st. And that's all I've got. This is K5KTX. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to Moon Day. I will be doing a presentation on star hopping. Uh, so stop by and uh, join the fun, and you'll be able to see all kinds of vendors. There's all the different astronomical societies, robotic societies usually there, National Space Society. So come out and have fun with us and get to hear speakers and talk to folks in the space program. So it's a really fun outing. All right, thank you very much, Kelly. Is there anyone else with any announcements? If so, please come now with your call sign. KZ5 Victor, Capel, Texas. Good evening, KZ5 Victor, uh, Jean and Coppell, were you just checking in or do you have an announcement for us? Um, just checking in, thank you. You are very welcome, sir, and we will get you checked in. Uh, Tom, if you will please record his, uh, he's on Echolink, so if you'll put him on our check-in list, that would be greatly appreciated. Is there anyone else that has any announcements? If so, please come now with your call sign. Okay, I'm not hearing anyone, so I'll go ahead with a few announcements of my own. The AMSAT Radio Amateur Satellite Group has two nets available to Dallas residents on Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m. Central Time. You'll need Echolink installed and you registered. You can find the net under Groups and AMSAT. Also, a live audio link is available on their website at www.amsatnet.com. This net originates in Houston, Texas. The Dallas AMSAT net, Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, is every Wednesday at 9 p.m. on the Arlington repeater, 147.140 MHz, with a PL tone of 110.9 and a positive offset. The DARC has several nets on Monday nights. Uh, first Monday of the month is Hand Fixins net, 
Uh, this is the net where we share recipes anecdotes, uh, you got a question about food, a story, a recipe to share, join us for Ham Fixin's. Second Monday of the month is MCOM 101, Emergency Communications. Third Monday is the second helping of Ham Fixin's Net. And fourth Monday is GeekNet. Always have good fun on GeekNet. Uh, on Wednesdays, their Veterans Net is first and third week from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Time. And Saturdays is the Night of Net with TechNet from 7 to 8 p.m., and of course at 9 p.m., SkyNet. And the ARRL Net, National Traffic System Training Net, is every night at 6.30 p.m. Central Time, and all are welcome to check in on any or all of these nets. And as was mentioned earlier, don't forget after SkyNet at 10.30, uh, is the Afterglow Movie Net. This is a net where we choose a movie and watch it during the week and then discuss it on the air. So uh, tonight is a uh, movie, uh, Killers from Space. So Dr. Douglas Martin was your average nuclear scientist. Good looking, logical, aircraft pilot, and slide rule whiz. But today isn't a normal day. For one thing, Martin wakes up after his plane crash with barely a scratch, but his slide rule is broken. Slide rules were not meant to be broken, he thought to himself as he hiked back to the Air Force base. Colonel Banks was waiting for Martin. Martin, he barked, where's my plane? And what the H do you think your government issued AB 1739B slide rule? Martin knew this day wasn't going his way. Join us for the Afterglow movie, Killers from Space, from 1954, tonight at 10.30 p.m. And you can keep up with all the DARC events, nets, and activities by going to the club website, w5fc.org. Okay, our next segment is Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas events, where and when you can look through a telescope. So if anyone, I know, uh, Sadly, it sounds like the Shores Star Party was canceled uh, by previous announcement. Does anybody else have any other announcements for the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas? If so, please come now with your call sign. K5, KTS. K5, go, K, uh, K5 KTX, go ahead with your announcement. All right, this is K5 KTX again, and tonight was the monthly uh, meeting for the Texas Astronomical Society, and um, the topic of the evening was we had several members that got up and talked about their experience at the recent Texas Star Party out in Fort Davis. It was a wonderful event, my 12th, and um, lots of great images that um, different people took, and so it was a lot of fun. Um, the Texas Astronomical Society does have monthly meetings, which are held on the fourth Friday of every month, except for November, when it's the third Friday, and there's usually not a me meeting in December. And the meetings are held at the University of Texas at Dallas campus in Richardson. The meeting begins at 7.30 p.m. in the Science Learning Center building, which is SLC Sierra Lima Charlie on the campus map. The best place to park is in Lot H, where we have been given permission to park in orange, gold, or green spaces between 6.30 and 10.30 p.m. You can park anywhere else as long as you choose a green painted space. Otherwise, you might get a ticket. The meeting includes programs presented by members or guest speakers and a slideshow of the current constellation of the month. excited to announce our June speaker that's coming up. Um, in June, the meeting will be on Friday, June the 22nd at 7.30 p.m. And our speaker um, is a young lady, 23-year-old, just turned 23, um, from Kosovo. Her name is Pranvera Hassini, and um, I've had the great opportunity to hear her speak a couple of times, and she was at the Texas Star Party this year and last year and become good friends with her, and she's a wonderful speaker, very inspiring, and she, um, 
He grew up in a very war-torn country. It's a very new country, and they had absolutely nothing in the way of astronomy, and she's been very interested in it for a long time. And um, she has managed to put together a team that goes out and does outreach. They call it the Astronomy Outreach of Kosovo. And she's done some amazing things in her country. They're actually in the process of building their own observatory. And so um, be sure to come. I'd love to fill the whole auditorium with people to come and hear her speak. Very, very inspirational speaker. So again, and that's June the 22nd at 7.30 p.m. Now, if you'll come to the meeting a little bit early, say at 7 o'clock p.m., we, we are going to have a beginning astronomy class, and the topic is shoestring astronomy, um, homemade astronomical instruments and accessories. So this should be a, a neat topic, especially for those of you who like to make your own stuff. So um, you can get it, all the information about the Texas Astronomical Society at texasastro.org. Um, host observing parties every Saturday night beginning at sunset and we have them at different locations tonight was supposed to be at Rockwell and as Eric mentioned it was canceled for some strange reason due to weather the only thing I can think of is that the field is a it is a grassy field and they did get quite a bit of rain yesterday and so maybe the field is too wet to set up on I'm not sure but um, anyway uh, so tonight was canceled um, so we go back to the first week, which is in Garland at Spring Park. The second Saturday is at Frisco Commons Park. Third Saturday, J.W. Williams Park in Cedar Hill. And then back to the fourth Saturday at Rockwall, the Lake Shores Park. Again, all of our events are free and open to the public. You don't need to be a member to participate, and um, they're a lot of fun. So again, go to texasastral.org, and you can get all of the information in our calendar and on our website. And that's all I've got. This is K5KTX. Back to you, Billy. Great. Thank you very much, Kelly. This is KF5PDS, your net control for this session of the DARC Skynet. Thank you for those wonderful announcements. And yeah, we definitely do not want to miss that June PATH meeting. All right. So up next, is National Space Society event. So at this time, I'll turn to Bill N5BB. Uh, what announcements do you have for us this evening regarding the National Space Society? Thank you very much, Billy. This is N5BB. <coughs> so as far as announcements, the, uh, nas the next local meeting of the National Space Society will be on the second Sunday afternoon of June. That's June the 10th, Sunday afternoon at 3.30 p.m. So this is uh, a little over two weeks from now. And it'll be at the normal location, which is Spring Creek, Spring Creek Barbecue in Irving at the corner of Beltline and Highway 183 across from Irving Mall. And I don't yet know the topic of that meeting. The uh, newsletter hasn't come out yet. Another activity coming up is on June the 30th, which is a Saturday. National Space Society will be participating with Asteroid Day uh, this year at the Perot Museum in downtown Dallas, Perot Museum of Nature and Science. We'll be participating there from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. If anybody has any questions about either activity, they're welcome to contact me, n5bb at uh, byram.net. That's n5bb at byram.net or n5bb at arrl.net, either one. I also have one um, other item from National Space Society. This is something from the National Space Society website. Disability can be a superpower in space. Disabled astronauts offer unique solutions to emergencies in space. According to Dr. Sherry Wells Jensen of Bowling Green University, disabilities can be superpowers for astronauts in space. 
they're presenting some things at International Space Development Conference. I'm going to be paraphrasing what I read here. So the 1997 fire aboard Russia's, Russia's Mir space station is an example of the advantages that disabled astronauts can bring to emergency situations. During the Mir fire, thick smoke obstructed the astronauts' vision. They couldn't see, so they couldn't find the fire extinguishers. A blind astronaut could find them immediately uh, or any of the other vital tools because they have a much, uh, they have a very good uh, ability to locate things in space without having to use vision. Uh, lighting systems are typically the first thing to fail in spacecraft emergencies. The sudden loss of light can disorient and panic sighted astronauts, handicapping, handicapping them when speed and awareness are paramount. But malfunctioning lights present no problems to a blind astronaut. Then there's people that have lost their limbs. Leglessness is no problem in a space of zero gravity. And also, they may be able to navigate in smaller areas than people with uh, two legs. Uh, there's also neuroplasticity. Uh, typically, disabled people uh, have neuroplasticity, which means uh, your brain can rewire itself. And that means they can uh, quite often uh, do interesting things that sighted people can't do, or, or people who are not handicapped can't do. So um, they're, they're suggesting that, that, that uh, NASA look at, and other groups, look at disabled people, uh, nor I should say differently abled people, and put them uh, into crews, to integrate into crews, to give them more flexibility in the future. That's all I have in 5BB. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Bill. All right. So next up is the MCS topic of the evening. So I have chosen as my topic how to find the Gegenschein. So I take my information from skyandtelescope.com, uh, October 2015 uh, issue uh, from an article by Bob King. Bob King is an amateur astronomer and longtime member of the American Association of Variable Star Observers, and he also teaches community education astronomy and writes a blog called Astro Bob, and he has a book called Wonders of the Night Sky You Must See Before You Die, which is a bucket list of essential sky sites uh, that was published and is available on Amazon. So uh, this article is very interesting. So we've all heard of the zodiacal light, but uh, its opposition effect called the Gegenschein is something that's not often talked about. So I wanted to talk about that and tell you how you could find it in the night sky. So first off, uh, Gegenschein is the German word for countershine, and the Gegenschein is a faint, diffuse brightening along the ecliptic directly opposite or counter the sun. Uh, at local midnight, the counter glow appears as a round to oval patch of light about 8 to 10 degrees across within the zodiac constellation crossing the southern meridian at that time. You can see it an hour or two earlier or later, but it's highest and easiest to spot during the midnight hour. As with its brighter cousin, the zodiacal light, we're seeing sunlight reflecting off dust ejected by comets and released during asteroid crack-ups. The greater part of it is concentrated in the plane of the solar system, the reason both phenomena are centered on the ecliptic, which is home to the planets, moon, and sun. Sunlight scattered forward off dust in the direction of the sun creates the zodiacal light, and backscattered light from dust directly opposite the sun toward the asteroid belt gives us the Gegenschein. Since the Gegenschein lies opposite the sun, much like a full moon or planet at opposition, sunlight strikes the dust particles square on. 
all the tiny shadows cast are hidden behind each and every grain, so they don't subtract from the belt's brightness, creating a brighter spot in the sky. The moon experiences a similar bump in brightness at the time of full phase. Astronomers call it the opposition effect. We also see the same phenomenon as a halo of light around our heads when looking at smooth or regularly textured ground with the sun at our back. From the darkest sites, you can actually see the path of the ecliptic as the hazy zodiacal band, a much fainter extension of the, both the zodiacal light and Gegenschein that wraps all the way around the sky. 20 miles north of his home in Duluth, Minnesota, the counterglow is plainly visible on moonless transparent nights during the fall and spring. And that's with the southwestern sky aglow with city light pollution. On the best nights, Mr. King has been able to trace a 50 degree segment of the fainter zodiacal band. So what do you need to be able to successfully see the Gegenschein? Well, to be successful, your eyes need to be fully dark adapted and the southern sky should be as free of light pollution as possible. For mid-northern observers, there are two peak viewing seasons, October through November and February through March. At these times, the Gegenschein is relatively high in the sky and little hindered by atmospheric absorption. If you can see the weak glow of the Milky Way in Taurus, you should be able to make out the Gegenschein, which is similarly dim. Check the calendar and look up at the appropriate spot along the zodiac for a very diffuse, puffy smudge, larger than you might imagine, nearly one outstretched fist, or 10 degrees across. Play your eye around the spot using the same averted vision technique you'd employ to eke out detail on a deep sky object through the telescope. Trust your gut if you think you see it, then look again in an hour. Has it moved westward with the stars? Yes? Well, then congratulations, you've found the Gegenschein. Look again another night and then another until your familiarity with the counterglow's appearance becomes second nature. You might think that December and January would make for best viewing when the counterglow peaks in altitude, but the Milky Way gets in the way making it extremely difficult to tell the two apart. The best viewing window this season continues to be about October 20th, then opens again from November 4th through the 20th. So this was in 2015. And remember that the Gegenschein reaches its peak altitude at 1 a.m. local daylight time, or midnight local standard time. So good luck in your Gegenschein quest. Um, so uh, at this time, uh, that's the end of the report. So uh, I'd like to call and see if there's anyone on frequency at this time that's ever seen the Gegenschein, if you would like to share your experience and what you saw and where you were when you saw it. I would appreciate any uh, information you could give. So if you have any uh, personal uh, per uh, firsthand sightings of the Gegenschein, please come now with your call sign. I'm not hearing any, so I guess we all have a, have a quest. We have a, a mission should you choose to accept it. Next time you're out in the dark sky, uh, see, and you're out at, at midnight local time, see if you can spot the Gegenschein and report back to Skynet. This is KF5PDS, your net control for this session of the DARC Skynet. All right, at this time, uh, I'd like to turn the net over to my alternate net control, KE5ICX, if you'll see if we have any more check-ins and then uh, give us our report on what we can see in the sky over the next couple of weeks. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Billy. I never, I didn't even know this existed. This is something I was completely uh, unaware of. Of course, I'm unaware of a lot of things, but this was one of them. So I'll, I'll check into this. This is very cool. Dark skies uh, needed. 
This is KE5ICX. I am alternate co net control this evening, even though I cannot talk. I'll go ahead and take any additional check-ins. If you'd like to join us this evening, please come now with your call sign, your name, where you're transmitting from. I'll put you on the list. Please come now. Kilo Charlie 5, Mike Alpha X ray Max in Ferris. River Foxtrot, two whiskey. Chris, just leaving DSW, headed to Rockwall. get those folks. We have KG5TNF, uh, and I lost your name. I should know it. I recognize the call, but I can't remember the name. Could you give it to me one more time, please? Or, yes, one more time, please. I knew I forgot something. Kilo Golf 5, Tango, November Foxtrot Mobile. This is Johnny out here. Now I'm just west of Carroll, Texas. Good, thank you, Johnny. KG5TNF over near Terrell. Thanks for checking in. Next uh, station I got, I got KC5MAX. Max, I think you said Paris, Texas. Is that correct? Or just give me your location one more time. Thank, thanks for checking in. Go ahead. KC5MAX. Yep, this is KC5MAX in Ferris, S-E-R-R-I-S. All right, I got you, Ferris, Texas. And then could I have your name one more time? Uh, I may have just written Max twice. Go ahead. That's correct, KC5MAX, Max. Just wanted to make sure. Don't want to mess up on names and call signs, which I do frequently. I got you down. KC5MAX, Max, over in Ferris, over on Echolink. NF2W, Chris Mobile, over in Rockwell. Any additional check-ins, please come down. Let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, this is a segment from EarthSky.org. Uh, you can go there as well, EarthSky.org forward slash tonight, and you can pick the night of the week. They usually have about a week's worth of um, viewing uh, information and opportunities to which you can follow along. I've gone ahead and uh, put on the W5FC.org website the links for what you can see in the sky this evening. And don't forget, EarthSky.org is the main site for all of this. So southeast dusk at nightfall, this is what they're saying for May 25th through the 28th. If you have a clear sky, you'll surely notice a bright star, and they put that in quotes, near the moon. This object is really the planet Jupiter. And by the way, I've been watching this thing every night since uh, in the evening I'm out on the patio and I can see all this, which is really convenient. Once Venus sets in the west, it's not long after the sun, the moon and Jupiter are the two brightest objects in the nighttime sky. Some of these nights you might notice a fainter true star, still one of our sky's brightest stars, Spica, in the moon's glare. Spica is the brightest star in the constellation Virgo Maiden, and it's a key star of the zodiac. 
though a first magnitude star, Spica is some 20 times fainter than Jupiter. But Jupiter's brightness stems from the relative nearness to Earth, while Spica is a distant star some 262 light years away. His magnitude is virtually the same as Antares, another key star of the zodiac. If you want to compare them but don't know how to recognize Antares, Jupiter resides roughly midway between these two bright stars, and the moon will travel close to Antares on the sky's dome on May 28th, as shown in the chart that I've got up, the south dusk nightfall. So go there and you'll, uh, the website and you'll see it. Notice how nearly full and round the moon appears in our sky this weekend. Jupiter and the moon will be closest on May 27th, and the moon will be full on May 29th. Meanwhile, this is Jupiter's opposition month, that is, Earth just flew between Jupiter and the Sun, placing Jupiter opposite the Sun in our sky. A full moon is also opposite the Sun, as seen from Earth. Thus, it's no accident that Jupiter is close on the sky's dome to this nearly full moon around now, but both Jupiter and the moon are more or less opposite the Sun. Now there's a, a chart there that says solar system planetary positions. This might help, showing where uh, opposition is with the sun. And it says two months from now, on July 27th, 2018, it'll be Mars that's in opposition, its first opposition in two years, and its best one since 2003. Jupiter is brighter than Mars now, but just wait. From about July 7th to September 7th of 2018, Mars will supersede Jupiter in brightness, who knew, and it will shine with a red color. In fact, in late July, Mars will shine bright, better than 30 times brighter than stars like Spica and Taurus, two of the brightest stars in our sky. You can see Mars tonight if you're willing to stay up late or wake up early. It's a noticeably bright star in the sky before dawn near the planet Saturn. chart for that. Uh, it's south before dawn. If you look there, you'll see where it is in direct south with Mars and Saturn. Uh, let's see. Back to the moon and Jupiter, though. You know the moon appears much brighter than Jupiter uh, in our sky, but that's only because the moon is so much closer to Earth than Jupiter. At present, the moon lies nearly 245,000 miles away, while Jupiter lies far beyond the moon at nearly 1,700 times the moon's distance from Earth. It's truly a giant world of our solar system. In fact, Jupiter's volume is greater than 1,300 Earth or 66,000 Earth moons. Jupiter is also some 318 times more massive than our planet Earth. The king planet is more than twice as massive as all the other solar system planets, dwarf planets, and minor planets and moons combined. Think about that as you see this giant planet in the moon's glare in the coming nights. So the bottom line is the nights of July 25th through 28th, the giant planet Jupiter is the brightest object in the moon's vicinity. Spike in the constellation Virgo and Antares in the constellation Scorpius are also nearby. I'll go ahead and uh, read from the U.S. Naval Observatory. I think we're on track here. The moon waxes in the evening sky this week, diving southward along the ecliptic as her phase increases. Full moon occurs on the 29th at 1019 Eastern Daylight. May's full moon has popular names that incorporate the pleasant planet climate of late spring. These include the milk moon, flower moon, and the corn planting moon. Luna passes less than a degree north of the second magnitude uh, star Parima in the constellation of Virgo on the night of the 24th. Parima is closely spaced double star whose components are now slowly separating as they orbit uh, their center of mass. This is one of the few double stars where a significant change in separation and position and angle of the components can be easily observed over a 10-year period. And it's one that 
and he says this that I followed for 30 years. The components are almost equal in brightness and are currently about three arc seconds apart. So they should be visible in a four inch telescope. The stars were closest in 2005. He says when I could not resolve them in my nine and a quarter inch scope. One night after Luna passes by Parima, she will be placed well north of Spica, the bright star in Virgo. On the 27th, she sits just to the east of the giant planet Jupiter. We continue. The moon washes out many of the fainter stars in the springtime sky, but one bright star stands out in the evening no matter how much light the moon throws at it. Uh, Arcturus shines with the glow of a shimmering topaz high in the eastern sky as twilight deepens. Arcturus is the brightest star in the northern hemisphere sky and the fourth brightest of all, only exceeded by Sirius and the southern hemisphere stars of Canopus and Alpha Centauri. It is relatively near to the solar system with a measured distance of just under 37 light years. Its mass is thought to be slightly greater than that of the sun, but its luminosity is some 100 70 times more than that of old Sol. Its age is estimated to be about 7 billion years, so Arcturus may be a good model to study the future fate of the Sun. Arcturus is an involved star that has depleted the supply of hydrogen in its core. It is now fusing hydrogen into helium in the shell around the core. This causes the star to swell in size to about 25 times the Sun's diameter. its surface expands, it cools, giving the star its characteristic warm color. It has the most rapid, proper motion of all the first magnitude stars, except the nearest, Alpha Centauri, moving at about two arc seconds per year. This means that it moves the apparent diameter of the moon's disk in 900 years. Arcturus proper motion was discovered in 1718 by the astronomer Edmund Halley, who noticed that it was far from the position measured by the Greek astronomer Hipp Hipp uh, Hipparchus some 1,800 years earlier. The name Arcturus derives from the ancient Greek and means the guardian of the bear for its position in the sky, following the stars that form the constellation Ursa Ur Ur Major. It is the lead star in the constellation of Bootes, the herdsman, which is, in my eye, uh, mind, looks more like a kite or an ice cream cone than that of uh, ancient interpretations of the man with the staff holding two dogs on a leash. We talked about them last week. The Arcturus, as Arcturus climbs in the east, Ursa Major crosses the meridian, meridian high overhead. The constellation signature asterism, the seven stars that form the Big Dipper, should be easy to find despite the increasing glow of light scattered from the moon. Onto the planets. Bright Venus still dazzles the western sky as evening twilight falls. She's now coursing her way through the stars of Gemini the Twins and reaches her most northerly declination in this year's evening apparition on the 22nd. She will continue her eastward trek across the stars and will start to slowly move southward over the horizon over the course of the next few months. Jupiter becomes visible in the southeast shortly after sunset. Rough, rough. And he spends the evening wheeling across the sky, crossing the meridian at around 11 p.m. The giant planet is at its best for telescopic viewing, and you should be able to enjoy him in the telescope all night long. In addition to looking for the planet's signature equatorial cloud belts and the great red spot, watch for changes in the configuration of his four Galilean moons. On the evening of the 23rd, Third, watch for his innermost moon, Io, drag its shadow across the planet's disk between 9.13 and 11.23. That's Eastern Daylight. Subtract an hour. Look for Saturn low in the southeast during the evening hours. Saturn spends most of the next several months in the vicinity of the top of the teapot asterism in Sagittarius and is near the most southerly declination in his 29-year orbit. Wait for a night for steady air to get a good glimpse of the ring planet. And then finally, Mars is beginning to slow his eastward progress uh, among the faint stars of uh, Capricornus as he nears this first 
stationary point of this year's uh, apparition, which he'll reach next month. Like Saturn, he will spend this year's apparition at near very southerly declination, so nights of steady air will give you the best views of this glowing, ruddy disk. Your best view of him this week continues to be in the hours before dawn. That is from what you can see in the sky this week from the U.S. Naval Observatory website, usno.military.mil. Or the better thing to do is just simply say you uh, go to your favorite uh, search engine and type in the sky this week and USNO, and you should be able to find it. And that's it from me and the reports from KE5ICX. Back to net control. Great. Thank you, Tom. And I think I even heard the Uti's hunting dog in the background. So way to bring that report to life. Uh, this is KF5PDS, your net control for this session of the BARC Skynet. All right. Uh, next we have our featured constellation. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to remind you that you can follow along on W5FC.org uh, with sky maps and notes. And at this time, I'll turn the net over to Carolyn. Uh, KC5OZT, the net is yours. Okay, thank you. This is KC5OZT, and tonight we're going to look at Corona Borealis, the Northern Crown. It is a small constellation with only four stars, brighter than magnitude three. It lies between Boethes and Hercules, and it represents the crown of Ariadne, a daughter of King Minos in Greek mythology. She helped uh, the hero Theseus kill the Minotaur and find his way out of the la labyrinth, and uh, was rewarded with being her crown being placed in the sky. Uh, it doesn't have any bright deep sky, deep sky objects, but it has two fascinating stars. It is a 73rd constellation in size. And um, we will look at the, the two brightest stars, though. Uh, we do have Alpha, which goes by the name of Alpheca. Uh, that means uh, the bright one of the broken ring in Arabic, or Gemma, G-E-M-M-A, -M -M which means jewel in Latin. Like I say, it's the brightest and uh, is made up of eclipsing binary stars that uh, period about 17 days. And uh, I think the primary component has uh, believed to have a large disk of dust material or maybe even planetary or protoplanetary system in its orbit. And then Beta is the second brightest star. It is also a spectroscopic binary with a period of about 10 years. It's about 114 light years away. Look at the stars of this constellation, so to speak. Well, look at those two variables. T, Corona Borealis, the blade star, and R, Corona Borealis, the fade-out star. And we'll look at R first. Uh, it's a yellow supergiant star, class L, and magnet usually magnitude 6.46. And like I say, it is a variable. And I have, um, I suppose Tom has them on the website, an A chart for uh, R. Corona Borealis, uh, 
so that you can watch it. It's called a fade out star because it uh, is it's a variable and every now and then it's brightness fades for several magnitudes. It's very irregular, but uh, it serves as a prototype for a whole class of stars known as the RCB variables. This is the result of a cloud of carbon dust created in the line of sight uh, to dim the star's magnitude by several magnitudes. And in the case of R, it ranges from a usual about 5.7 to it can dim down about magnitude 14. And then it as this cloud of dust that it produced moves away, it becomes brighter again. And um, because it had, it's such a dramatic change in brightness, R is known as the fade-out star or a reverse nova. And this and the next star are ones that you should look at this constellation every night. If you can see it, of course. And uh, watch uh, see it makes to see if uh, if R has started fading. Well, the chart, this variable star chart has the uh, numbers or magnitudes without a period. And, and you can compare them, and uh, if you watch it uh, over one night or over several nights, you will see it change. This is one of the stars, like I say, you should watch every time you look, and you can see the constellation. And then the next one, definitely, is T Corona Borealis. It's known as a blaze star, and it's what's called a recurrent nova. It is a spectroscopic binary, but the star usually has a magnitude of about 10 to 10.8, and that's visible in some amateur scopes, but it had been seen to reach magnitude 2, that was in 1866. In 1946, it suddenly brightened to magnitude 3, and it's a red giant, spectral type M, about 2,000 light years away, but, um, um, you definitely, it's something to take an eye on, so you never know when it might brighten. And uh, uh, you'd hate to miss it. There's, let me reset. There's a story of the Leslie Peltier, a variable star observer. He watched it every night just to be sure he didn't miss it and uh, kept tabs on it. And unfortunately, on February 9th, 1946, he woke up, but he had a cold, so he thought, well, I'll just stay in bed this morning, and behold, that was the night the tea uh, flared up and it became visible. He always regretted missing that. Two very variable, very uh, uh, interesting stars to watch as you go along and uh, uh, check them every night. And uh, like I said, uh, we, we don't have any bright deep sky objects. Uh, there is a faint uh, galaxy cluster, A Bell 2065. Southwest of Beta, but uh, about 400 galaxies. Uh, 
and about one degree, but the brightest one is about magnitude 16. So, uh, and wouldn't be able, probably wouldn't be able to see it, but definitely keep an eye on R and T, and uh, you never know when you might be the one to spot it suddenly rising or in the case of T, or suddenly falling, in the case of R. And you can report this to the AAVSO if you see it. Uh, but uh, anyway, if, unless anyone has any questions, uh, Billy, I'll turn it back to you, case 5 ozt Thank you very much, Carolyn. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Carolyn before we move on to our next topic? If so, please come now with your call. Not hearing anyone, so this is KFI PDS, your net control for this session of the DARC Skynet. All right, next up is recent astronomical discoveries. So at this time, I will turn the net over to Ms. Brenda, WB5OZL. The net is yours. Okay, first article is entitled, Mars Rocks May Harbor Signs of Life from Four Billion Years Ago. Iron-rich rocks near ancient lake sites on Mars could hold vital clues the show life once existed there, research suggests. These rocks, which formed in lake beds, are the best place to seek fossil evidence of life from billions of years ago, researchers say. A new study that sheds light on where fossils might be preserved could aim the search for traces of tiny creatures, known as microbes, on Mars, which it is thought may have supported primitive life forms around four billion years ago. A team of scientists has determined the sedimentary rocks made of compacted mud or clay are the most likely to contain fossils. These rocks are rich in iron and a mineral called silica, which helps preserve fossils. They formed during the Noatian and Hesperian periods of Martian history between three and four billion years ago. At that time, the planet's surface was abundant in water, which could have supported life. The rocks are much better preserved than those of the same age on Earth, researchers say. This is because Mars is not subject to plate tectonics, the movement of huge rocky slabs that form the crust of some planets, which over time can destroy rocks and fossils inside them. The team re reviewed studies of fossils on Earth and assessed the results of lab experiments replicating Martian conditions to identify the most promising sites on the planet to explore for traces of ancient life. Their findings could help inform NASA's next rover mission to the Red Planet, which will focus on searching for evidence of past life. The U.S. Space Agency's Mars 2020 rover will collect rock samples to be returned to Earth for analysis by a future mission. A similar mission led by the European Space Agency is also planned in coming years. The latest study of moon rocks, led by a researcher from the University of Edinburgh, could aid in the selection of landing sites for both missions, and it can also help to identify the best places to gather rock samples. published in Journal of Phys Geophysical Research also involve researchers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Brown University, California Institute of Technology, Massachusetts, Institute of Technology, and Yale University, I'm sorry, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Yale University in the U.S. Dr. Sean McMahon, a Marie Sklodowska Curie, fellow in the University of Edinburgh's School of Physics and Astronomy said, there are inter many interesting rock and mineral outcrops on Mars, 
where we would like to search for fossils. But since we can't send rovers to all of them, we have tried to prioritize the most promising deposits based on the best available information. Okay, I'm just going to read that one article tonight because we're kind of short on time. It's from ScienceDaily.com, and I will turn it back to the net now. This is WB5OZL. Hey, thank you, Brenda. And next up is Space Exploration and Space History. So at this time, I will turn the net over to Kelly, K5KTX. The net is yours. This is K5KTX, and there's been quite a bit of, of news uh, with NASA this past week, starting with the Curiosity mission. If you remember a few months ago, I mentioned um, that Curiosity had lost its ability to use the drill, and they've been working um, really hard at, at testing a new way for the rover to drill rocks and extract powder from them. This past weekend, that effort produced the first drilled sample on Mars in more than a year. Curiosity tested percussive drilling this past weekend, penetrating about two inches into a target called Duluth. NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, has been testing this drilling technique since a mechanical problem took Curiosity's drill offline in December of 2016. This technique, called feed extended drilling, keeps the drill fit extended out past two stabilizer posts that were originally used to steady the drill against Martian rocks. It lets Curiosity drill using the force of its robotic arm a little more like the way a human would drill into a wall at home. Drilling is a vitally important part of Curiosity's capabilities to study Mars. Inside the rover are two laboratories that are able to conduct chemical and mineralogical analyses of rock and soil samples. The samples are acquired from Gale Crater, which the rover has been exploring since 2012. Curiosity's science team has been eager to get the drill working before the rover leaves its current location near Vera Rubin Ridge. Fortunately, it was near enough to drill targets like the Luz to drive back down the ridge. Sunday's drill sample represents a quick taste of the region before Curiosity moves on. Demonstrating that Curiosity's percussive drilling technique works is a milestone in itself, but that doesn't mean the work is over for engineers at JPL. Well, we've been developing this new drilling technique for over a year, but our job isn't done once a sample has been collected on Mars, said JPL's Tom Green, a systems engineer who helped develop and test Curiosity's new drilling method. With each new test, we closely examine the data to look for improvements we can make and then head back to our test bed to, uh, to iterate the process. There's also the next step to work on, delivering the rock sample from the drill bit to the two laboratories inside the rover. Having captured enough powder inside the drill, engineers will now use the rover's cameras to estimate how much trickles out while running the drill backwards. The drill's percussion mechanism is also used to tap out powder. As of yesterday, the Curiosity team was planning to test a new process for delivering samples into the rover's laboratories. other news, NASA's planet-hunting Kepler spacecraft began the 18th observing campaign of its extended mission K2 on May the 12th. For the next 82 days, Kepler will stare at clusters of stars, faraway galaxies, and a handful of solar system objects, including comets, objects beyond Neptune, and an asteroid. The Kepler spacecraft is expected to run out of fuel within several months. <coughs> campaign 18 is a familiar patch of space as it's approximately the same region of sky that Kepler observed during Campaign 5 in 2015. One of the advantages of observing a field over again is that planets outside the solar system, called exoplanets, may be found orbiting farther from their stars. Astronomers hope to not only discover new exoplanets during this campaign, but also to confirm candidates that were previously identified. Um, starting with May the 20th, back in 1988. By executive order, President Ronald Reagan designated the National Space Technology Laboratories of NASA in the state of Mississippi as the John C. Stennis Space Center, or SSC. 
John Stennis served as a United States Senator for more than 40 years, in which time he supported the space program from its beginning and was an advocate for the leadership of the United States in space. The center is self-played at the time of this designation and continues to play an important role in the nation's space program. Today, the SSC houses the rocket test complex used for testing all manned Apollo and shuttle flights and which continues to be used for testing next generation engines and rocket stages. On May the 22nd, back in 1906, Three years after they filed a request for their basic flying machine patent, Orville and Wilbur Wright were granted U.S. Patent 821-393 for new and useful improvement in flying machines. Prior to the patent request in 1903, the brothers built various craft and tools to research the workings of wings and aircraft control systems. These included kites and other unpowered aircraft, and even their own wind tunnels to test and compare the aerodynamic qualities of various wing models. On December 17, 1903, the Wright brothers got off the ground in four short flights at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, but they kept their achievement under wraps until they could protect the secrets of their control system with a patent. During the long wait for approval of the patent, the brothers continued developing motors and designs of their flying machines. By 1905, their third major design was able to fly for tens of miles at a time and with a degree of control that was unmatched. The level of sophistication of the Wright design would not be appreciated until 1908 when Wilbur Wright flew a series of demonstrations in France. May the 24th, 1962, at 7.45 a.m. Eastern Time, astronaut Scott Carpenter left Cape Canaveral, Florida, Florida, on top of the Mercury Atlas 7 to become the fourth American in space and the second American to orbit the Earth. Carpenter's mission followed the same profile as John Glenn's orbital flight three months earlier in order to provide more data on astronaut performance in orbit. In his Mercury spacecraft, the Aurora 7, Scott Carpenter did just that, confirming the success of the Mercury Atlas 6, John Glenn's mission. Carpenter completed three revolutions of Earth in four hours and 56 minutes. Some problems with the automatic control and stabilization system combined with a rushed checklist, the return to Earth was not as successful as the rest of the mission. The Aurora 7 splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean at 12.41 p.m. Eastern Time, but had overshot the intended landing area by 250 nautical miles. After three hours floating in his raft, Carpenter was picked up by a helicopter sent from the USS Intrepid, and the capsule was retrieved approximately six hours later in a combined effort from the USS Farragut and the USS John R. Pierce. On his return to Cape Canaveral, NASA Administrator James Webb presented Carpenter with the NASA Distinguished Service Medal. As Billy mentioned earlier, we did lose um, Alan Bean uh, today, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about his life and career. Alan Bean, the fourth man to walk on the moon's surface, died on Saturday at age 86 after falling ill. Bean, a former test pilot in the U.S. Navy, was among 14 people NASA selected in 1963 for a new group of astronauts. He flew into space twice and became the fourth person to walk on the moon on November 19, 1969. His death was announced by his family in a statement made through NASA. They said he became suddenly ill while traveling through Indiana two weeks ago. Alan was the strongest and kindest man I ever knew. He was the love of my life and I miss him dearly, said Leslie Bean, Alan Bean's wife of 40 years. A native, native Texan, Allen died peacefully in Houston, surrounded by those who loved him. Bean's trail behind visits to the moon by Neil Armstrong, and P. Conrad, who was also on the Apollo 12 mission with him. During his time on the moon, Bean initiated experiments and installed the first nuclear-powered generator station on the moon to provide the power source, NASA said. He and Conrad also collected 75 pounds of soil and rocks to bring back to Earth for study. Bean also flew into space in 1973 as the commander of the second crewed flight to the U.S. U.S.'s first space station, NASA said. Alan and I have been best friends for 55 years. 
Ever since the day we became astronauts, Walt Cunningham, a fellow astronaut who flew on Apollo 7, said in a statement through NASA, quote, we have never been more than a couple of miles apart even after we left NASA, and for years, Alan and I never missed a month where we did not have a cheeseburger together at Miller's Cafe in Houston. We are accustomed to losing friends in our business, but this one is a tough one, end quote. And this is K5 KTX. Great. Thank you very much, Kelly, uh, for bringing those reports. Uh, all right. It looks like we're running a little bit short on time, so we will not have time for the visible satellite passages report, but I will give you the information where you can go look this up. Uh, you can use the website www.heavens-above.com, and you can put in your own uh, GPS coordinates or city and state and uh, it will adjust to your position, and then you can look up satellite passages and more on this website. So again, that's www.heavens-above.com. All right, um, at this time, I'll return the net to Tom, KE5ICX, if you'll see if we have any final check-ins, and give me a final count for this evening's net. This is KFI's TDS net control for Skynet. This is KE5ICX. Um, Tom, I'm alternate net control this evening. I'd like to acknowledge David, KG5ZCT, uh, Zulu Charlie Tango, over on Echolink. I've got you checked in finally, David. Additional check-ins, anyone, any mode, please come now. This is Kilo Bravo 5 Delta Romeo Juliet. Kilo Golf 5. I'm completely Golf operational and all my circuits are functioning perfectly. Afterglow Movie Net. Hello, Fox Drive 5, Hotel Mike Sierra, Bill in Grand Prairie. Kilo, Fox Drive 5, Tango Sierra Kilo, Burl in Dallas. Very good. I've got a I'm going to need a couple of fills here. I've got Kilo Bravo 5, uh, Delta Romeo Juliet. Can I have your name, please, sir, and where you're transmitting from? Yes, my name is David, and I'm transmitting from Carrollton, KP5DRJ. Hey, thanks. KB5DRJ, David, in Carrollton. The next station you got covered over by the announcement. I've got Kilo Golf, and then I lost it. Not your fault, our repeater's fault. Uh, if you could give me your full uh, call sign, your name, where you're transmitting from, I'll put you on the list. I'll take another round in a minute. Uh, KF5 HMS, uh, Bill, over in Grand Prairie. I've got you, KF5 TSK, Burl in Dallas. Anybody I miss, please come down. And I've got K5JDW, John. I think he's in Norman this evening. I got you checked in. Okay, we have uh, 28 current check-ins, including your uh, net control. So uh, back to net control. This is KE5ICX.
Great. Copy that 28 check-ins. Uh, so tonight we had 28 hands participating on the air. So thank you to all who checked in this evening. Uh, we hope you'll join us here next week and every Saturday night at 9 p.m. to discuss astronomy, space, and space exploration. On this net, the sky is never the limit. We're always looking for net control stations for this and all the other DARC nets. If you'd like to try your hand at this, contact any of the net controls by sending an email to nets at w5fc.org. You can follow topics and discussion about this net and astronomy in general on Facebook and Twitter, as well as our audio and video streams, video archives, and other useful internet resources by going to w5fc.org at the conclusion of this net. So until next Saturday night, this is KF5PDS, Billy, and I'll be closing the net at 2232 local time and returning the repeater to normal amateur use. So 73, everyone, and enjoy the evening discovering the universe. And don't forget, uh, coming up in probably about five minutes will be the Afterglow Movie Net where we'll be discussing 1954's Killers from Space. 73, everyone, and have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend.
need to use the net before we start with the afterglow net. Please come now. WB5OZL, and I have the distinct pleasure of being net control tonight for uh, the best movie I have ever seen, Killers from Space. I will now uh, defer to my colleague, w, uh, K5ICX, who will give us a synopsis of this fine piece of work. Go ahead, Tom. Why, thank you, esteemed colleague. This is KE5ICX, and yeah, I saw the movie Killers from Space, a.k.a. A, a.k.a. the man who saved the Earth. I don't know where that came from. It's from 1954. It was independently made, an American black and white science fiction film produced and directed by W. Lee Wilder. He's the brother of a real director, Billy Wilder. That stars Peter Graves, Barbara Best Star, Best Star, Best Star, Frank uh, somebody, uh, James C. and uh, Steve Pendleton. The film originated from an original commission screenplay by his son, Miles Wilder. Miles was seven when he did this. And their regular collaborator, William Raynor. Lee Wildner's production company, Planet Film Plays usually producing a, on a finan financing for distribution basis for United Artists, made this film for RKO Studios, you know who they are, uh, distribution. All right, this plot is so ridiculous, I'm going to read the whole thing. Dr. Douglas Martin, played by Peter Graves, is a nuclear scientist working in an atomic bomb test while uh, collecting aerial data from the United States Air Force, that's USAF to you and me, atomic blast at Soledad Flats. He loses control of his aircraft and crashes. He appears to have survived unhurt, walking back to the air base with no memory of what happened. On his chest is a strange scar that was not there before the crash. At the base hospital, Martin is ex so strangely that the USAF brings in the FBI, PDQ, to investigate, thinking he might be an imposter. He is eventually cleared, but told to take some time off. Martin protests being excluded from his project while on leave. When an atomic test is set off without his knowledge. Martin steals the data, then goes back to Soledad Flats and places the information under a stone. Of course he does. The FBI agent follows him, but Martin is able to elude him until he crashes his car. Now back to the hospital. He is given a truth serum. Deep under the drug's influence, Martin tells a story about how being held captive by space aliens led by dead nap. Yeah, the star. In their underground base, the aliens with large bulging eyes are from the planet Astron Delta, ruled by and being called the Tala. They revived his lifeless body as he had died in his aircraft. The aliens plan to exterminate humanity using giant insects and reptiles grown with the radiation absorbed from our own atomic bomb test. Martin intuits that the aliens use stolen electronic grid power to control their powerful equipment. This is so that the A-bombs released energy levels can be predicted and then balanced. The aliens wiped his memory and hypnotized him into collecting the data for them. There's more. The FBI agent and the base commander are skeptical of this incredible story and begin and keep him confined in the hospital. Nevertheless, the attending physician says that Martin genuinely believes that he what he has told them is true. And then finally, with the calculations made with a slide rule, Martin determines that if he shuts the power off to so dad height uh, flats, 
For just 10 seconds, it will create an overload in the alien's equipment. So he escapes from the hospital and goes to the nearby electrical plant, why not, where he forces a technician to turn off the power. After 10 seconds, the alien base is destroyed in a massive explosion, saving the Earth from conquest. Thus ends my uh, synopsis of this fine movie, Killers from Space. Back to Net Control. This is shameably KE5ICX. check-ins of uh, low power and short time. Let us know if you have seen this movie, so please come now. November Tango 5, Tango Mike. Tony and Dallas, I have seen part of the movie, sadly. ICX Tom. Yeah, I saw the movie. Really, I did. Echo Bravo Bravo. Yes, I did see this piece of cinematic history. This is November 5 Bravo. <coughs> Excuse me. November 5 Bravo Bravo. I haven't seen it recently. I probably saw it sometime in the past. But I just want to make sure we talk about the movie we're seeing tomorrow, assuming that's still on. If we talked about that during the net, I missed it in 5BB. Back up. NT5 uh, TM Tony has seen the movie. ICX Tom has. Uh, W5 EDD David, I uh, believe you said yes, and N5 BB Bill, yes. Um, this might be a good pa time to pause and talk about um, the, uh, the movie tomorrow before people start uh, leaving and falling asleep. Tom, KE5 ICX, do you want to mention that? I don't remember it during... Um, the uh, the previous net, so uh, why don't you go ahead and talk about it. I can do that, and there was a double there, KC5OZT, Miss Carolyn is uh, attempting to check in. Uh, we are going to the Sinmark 17, that's at 635 and 35. Uh, we're going to the 1230 IMAX um, presentation. You can go ahead and get tickets ahead of time if you would like. Probably would be a good idea as for this film the first week of release. I think it came out on Friday. So uh, you can go to um, what is it? Fandango. Fandango. Fandango, I think is what it's called. Or just type it in and say you'd like to see Solo, the, uh, the A Star Wars Story. So we're going to go see that. I think there's about five of us so far. There may be more. Uh, we'll meet up there. The movie starts at 12.30, 12.30 uh, p.m. That's afternoon, 12.30. And we'll probably meet up there around uh, 12 o'clock or thereabouts because there will be 9 million uh, previews along the way. Uh, we usually meet. Let me reset. We meet over in the Starbucks type thing just to the right of the theater entrance and then we wave people down in case they look lost. Typically they're ham radio operators because they have a handy talkie on them or 
uh, dress awkwardly or are super nerds. Uh, that's all good because we're all those people. So come on by, and we'll uh, we know who you are. Uh, come on in. You don't have to be a regular on this net if you'd like to just see the film. In fact, we got a couple who are coming to the movie who are not regulars on this. So we'll get an opportunity to see the film. After it's over, which is about two hours plus, maybe a little less, uh, we will, uh, whoever is interested, hit one of the 9,000 restaurants that are nearby the theater. So it's in Mark 17, 635 and 35. Uh, you'll find it there. I think it's in Mark 17. Did I say 13? I think I said 17. 17 is what it is. Uh, that's it from me, KE5 ICF. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, KC5OZT, Carolyn also uh, checked in. Did you see the movie, Carolyn? Well, I've seen it several times over the years on TV, and then I watched it again last night. KC5OZT. Okay, let's move on with more check-ins. This will be um, regular check-ins at this point. Kilo Golf 5, Bravo Zulu Whiskey, Jay, and I did see most of it. This is KFI's PDF, Billy and Sherman, and yes, I saw the film. KFI-TSK Burl, who did see the movie, KFI-PDS Billy, who did, and also we have KG5DZWJ checking in. Uh, I assume you saw the movie. Is that, uh, we will assume that. Okay, any other, uh, any echo link now? We'll give you a couple extra seconds. Okay, let's dive in. NT5 TM Tony. Uh, we're going to start with the plot. Um, so what do you have to offer in wisdom about this plot? Go ahead. There are many things that are better than this plot. You could mow your lawn, water your plants, go play with your dog. Uh, but if you did by some mischance see the first part of this movie as I did, uh, I, you would, I stopped just before the truth serum, you would see the plot was horribly padded. Uh, it has the two key things of a bad sheet movie. The first is that it ties into something topical. In the 70s, it was CB radio. In the 50s, it was apparently atomic testing. The second is that it uses lots of padded stock footage. If someone makes a phone call, we have to see a shot of phone operators with a plug board. If someone is driving a car, we see shots of a automobile factory. If there's going to be an atomic test, they have stock footage of soldiers getting into trenches with their special atomic sunglasses on. Uh, so at about 25 minutes into the movie, I decided I would rather listen to a podcast about how police catch serial killers because that sounded kind of cool and exciting. Uh, 
that's, that's as far as I got, but it was bad. NT5 TM. Oh no, you missed the stock footage of giant lizards and insects. The ones that have been enlarged by the aliens and are going to eat all the humans on Earth, thereby clearing the way for aliens to, uh, to, <laughs> to come and take over. Um, that's on the tape. That stock, I think this thing was about half stock footage. So, um, yeah. Well, bonus, there was a Connie in there and some other cool airplanes. So I enjoyed that. I did not enjoy the giant lizards. Okay, uh, K5ICX Tom, give us your thoughts. Oh my goodness, I don't even know where to begin or end. Actually, I should end right now. Uh, the plot was padded. I agree with Tony completely. This thing just went on and on and on and on. Uh, the the you, the the interview and uh, with the the guy uh, after the plane had crashed and everything it just went it went on forever. The only thing that actually came out of this that was halfway decent is Peter Graves tried to make a a a convincing performance as Douglas Martin. The aliens are clumsy in in their plotting and scheming and how they're going to make all this stuff work in the end. I don't know. It just, it just, there's not a lot there story-wise, and the dialogue is stiff. There's really not a lot of uh, emoting of any sort. There's no reason to care about anything. It's, it's sort of like a dragnet police procedural of sorts in the first half of this movie. Uh, and then the second half is just padded with insects everywhere going uh, as Peter Graves, I mean, Dr. Douglas Martin tries to escape. It goes on and on. I mean, I went and started cooking dinner uh, when this was happening, and I didn't miss darn things. So if you want to see a movie where nothing happens for the first part of the film and then the second part of the film, uh, it's... It, this is the film you want to watch. I've got lots to talk about on the special effects and the music, or lack thereof. This is KE5ICX. Hey, there were special effects? Hmm. Yeah, let's just assume Peter Grace was young and stupid and really needed the money because he's such a good actor and, and was in so many good roles in... Uh, I bet he wishes this would have disappeared into the cornfield at some point. But here it is. Okay, uh, W5EBB, go ahead. Well, the plot was, uh, yeah, as bad as everyone said, but it was ameliorated by the uh, comical commentary of the version that I saw. Very lowbrow, sophomoric, but on point. I think yeah, pretty pretty darn funny, really. But uh, yeah, the plot was was kind of kind of out there. The movie didn't seem to know what it wanted to be. Didn't want to be uh, uh, well. With it, I thought that the main villain was Robert Vaughn from Beneath the Planet of the Apes. So it had a little bit of that going for it. A little bit of Dragnet. A little bit of the Man from Uncle. But it, the movie just didn't know where it wanted to go. And you know that was pretty much the way the plot went. W five E B B. Okay, N5BB, Bill, what say you? This is N5BB. I'm sorry, it's been many, many years since I've seen it, so I'm just going to listen, N5BB. Okay, KC5OZ. Carolyn. Pretty weak. Uh, of course, remember when it was made? That was people were afraid of contrast and stuff. So uh, I suppose it uh, was more relevant then. But uh, yeah, I know it's. Uh, 
and such crazy aliens uh, with those eyes. That was a weak point, seemed like. Uh, and yeah, I'm, uh, remember, this was probably for the Saturday afternoon matinee and stuff with kids, you know, and uh, so maybe they just didn't bother getting into the details or just didn't have time, but, uh, but at least it ended happily, at least, but that's about all you can say for it. H5OZT. Hey, Burl, KF5TSK, go ahead. Oh, this is KF5TSK. I will say that the, uh, you know, they try to develop the plot, and it's like they would, you know, just leave something and, and go to something else, a totally uh, different scene, and it's like, uh, one of the things about, uh, you know, atomic tests, you know, this is really 10 years after Hiroshima, and I'm sure everyone had had a great knowledge of what's going on. You know, uh, you turn off the power on one power station, and supposedly the rest of the country is supposed to go dark, too. I mean, so many things were just out of place that... Uh, it was hard to follow. Uh, probably didn't make a lot of sense. And, and like I said, that, uh, you know, 10 years after your Sherry, I'm sure that uh, people were, you know, well versed on what radiation is or what it would do. Can't find TSK back to net. Billy, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with what's been said. I thought this movie was a total waste of perfectly good potential. Um, I was ag uh, totally in agreement with they had started several ideas and then, you know, didn't finish them uh, and wasted a perfectly good actor in Peter Graves. Uh, so yeah, I, I agree. I think if the aliens had stopped talking and just attacked, and they, if they were had been more back and forth with moves and counter moves and made it more of a fight, that uh, this would have been a much more interesting film, and it could have been great. At, you know, if they had a, had more action. And normally, I'm not averse to talking in films, but this is one where talking killed the movie. Uh, you know, and yeah, the stock footage abounded, but they just didn't make good use of any of it. Uh, and I'm not averse to giant lizards. It was the spiders that bothered the heck out of me. I do not like spiders, and so showing spider footage, ah, eh, no. But that there again, they missed an opportunity to tap into the creepy crawly horror. Um, you know, you had 1950s nuclear paranoia. You had Peter Graves, a wonderful actor, strong who, a lead who could carry a whole film. You had large, radi irradiated lizards and spiders that could have run amok and wreck, you know, wreck havoc on a town. Um, but no, they were just caged up underground in some caves, you know. Uh, and yeah, the aliens. I liked the plotting nature of the aliens, though they're very slow and methodical. That could have been sinister. But the goofy eyeballs made it laughable. Although I kind of liked that, I, I was la had a good chuckle at the at the crazy eyes. Um, but uh, yeah, just so much potential here. It could could have been a great 1950s sci-fi uh, film, but it just fell too short of the mark. So those are my comments. This is KF5 PDS back to net. Thanks, Billy. Okay, uh, KG5BZWJ, go ahead. This is KG5BZW. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, try to, to say something different here. Um, yeah, that, 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 that exposition of the, uh, the, uh, I should have looked up the trope that I'm trying to say, but that was 
the most boring exposition of the evil overlord, you know, going to tell you, the, the type of trope where you, you hear from the Bond villain how, you know, they're going to take over the world. That literally, that, the, 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 Ask the uh, aliens, which I I can't even remember the name. It was that interesting. Uh, I ha, that, I mean that's not exactly the that trope is not exactly beginning to begin with. But that was probably the worst exposition of you know their, of their plan of uh, of a uh, of a. Uh, antagonist plans uh, that I've ever can think of that I've ever seen. Um, so there's that. Um, lots of bad pl- pl- plot padding. Yeah, and, and the funny about, thing about that is there's so much plot padding, but there are things that they just did not explain that could have been uh, used for sinister purposes. Like, okay, so uh, uh, the Graves character, uh, he kept on seeing these eyes floating towards him. Same, did they ever explain that? I mean, besides this, oh, okay, it's these guys. Why did he keep on having these visions? I, I never saw any explanation for that. And that could have been integrated into the plot in such a cool way that it but they didn't do anything with that. It's just, uh, um, okay, let me reset. I don't know that I can add anything else to the, about the plot. Uh, so I think I'll just head, hand it back to, uh, DV5. Oh, wait a second. Am I, God, no, no, no. Am I getting my calls out? I'll hand it back to Net Control. And I, I'm sorry for, Getting my call sign confused. KG5 easy there. Brady. Yeah, I can just can just see some guys sitting around in a bar going, Oh, let's make a movie. How about um uh, some alien planet is being destroyed because of something and so they decided to come to Earth and kill all the humans and take over. Wow, that's really a unique idea. Nobody else ever thought of that. Um, and the plan to have giant creatures, these aliens really needed to do some research and watch some other movies because the giant creatures have always been uh, defeated by the humans. They think they're going to send some giant lizards out and they're going to eat us all? Oh, think again. There must have been a giant lizard movie in there somewhere. I know there was giant ants and giant rabbits and uh, the 50-foot woman. Uh, Huge monstrous things don't deter us at all. We just uh, obliterate them. So, um... was just whipped out and had no, I know it had no budget, obviously, and uh, I guess somebody's trying to get into the movie business. I don't know if this director, if his brother was always already making decent movies at this time with Me Too or what, but uh, what a, his brother's an Oscar-winning director, writer, uh, with a huge, huge, wonderful filmography, and uh, this is just such an abysmal uh, loser, so. Oh, well. Okay, any more check-ins? All right, this is dv 5 ozl We'll start back at the top of the list in T5TM, Tony. Uh, what did you think about the characters? What I can remember of them from what I saw is not much. I thought they were all utterly forgettable and boring. Uh, 
I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, not much to say. NT5 TM. Oh, okay. Uh, K5 ICX. Go ahead. All right, well, let's see if I can pad this out like they do in the movie. Think of the the 12 tones that they did throughout the score. And uh, dun 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 there's very little story. There's very little you can actually, you know, draw together. Gra uh, Peter Graves uh, did a pretty good job as Martin trying to figure out how the heck uh, to uh, be this guy out of water, this, this person who has to uh, say, look, I didn't die in the crash, but you should have died in the crash. But I didn't die in the crash. And then they go and they send it through... Uh, the FBI, because the FBI has, because they were so good, all of the fingerprints everywhere, and sure enough, this is the guy. He is the guy that should have died in the crash in a terrible special effect thing. Uh, and let me reset for a minute because i got to reset my brain to figure out where I'm going with this. there and he says he is who he is and they say well yeah he is who he is uh, I guess so but can we believe him and oh geez I won't even say what that sounds like in this day and age but the the thing that I'm having a Roomba moment is trying to figure out exactly what the heck this is supposed to mean you've got um, U.S. Air Force there trying to figure out where he's at how he's uh, somehow involved. Um, there's this part where he goes in and he has complete uh, access to the base and uh, people don't care. They, they give him the third degree and then all of a sudden he can go and open uh, uh, vaults and there's no problem with that. And then he's uh, driving on the road and, you know, he crashes and they bring him back and say, you shouldn't do that. And it's like... I, I don't know. It's I think this thing was written by committee, and they kept trying to figure out what to do. It just was kind of a jumbled mess. I won't even go into the technical aspects of the film. That's on the next round. Oh, I've, I've got things to say about that one. So uh, I think I've padded it out. Here's the music. Ding, 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 ding a violin, and a piano. Uh, back to net control. This is KE5 ICX. Okay. Good comments, Tom. Um, I looked on Wikipedia. They did not tell us who wrote the music. So my guess is it was probably stock music as well. Uh, that's my best guess. And I tried to figure out what the eyes are made of. I've not been able to discern that yet. I'm thinking ping pong balls and shoe polish, but uh, I, uh, who knows. All right, next is uh, W5EBB. David, go ahead. I had some relation to, I think, was uh, I love you, Philip Morris, because in every scene there was somebody, I think, lighting up a cigarette. Now, Peter Graves, I actually didn't know he was in this movie. But, uh, you know, this, this is probably the youngest version of Peter Graves uh, I've ever seen. And, uh, you know, he did an adequate job, I guess, but not, not having a lot to work with. Although his physique was, was uh, gratuitous, gratuitously shown, you know, and, you know, he, ha he has a nice build, broad shoulders. He probably got the nickname the Human Coat Hanger, maybe in high school or a Turkish prison. But he also could have been a stand-in for Boris Karloff, uh, which might have been a better role for him than this particular movie. Now, the, uh, the aliens, okay. They, they, this movie actually probably was the, uh, I guess, inspiration for 
the cheapest Halloween costume that anyone could ever buy. Just two bulbous eyes and, you know, you're done. And also, uh, if you look on online, the, the posters for this movie are actually more interesting than the movie itself. And I'm looking at three of these aliens in blue with their... And Blue Man Group. The Blue Man Group, right there. The, the, that, that was what the, uh, they based they, they, the aliens on, I think. Blue Man Group. All right, I'm done. w 5 EBD. Fingers and opposable thumbs, but they wore mittens. You have a, a an advanced technological society when you uh, handicap yourself like that. You can't use your fingers. That made no sense to me at all. All right, in, uh, Bill in 5 DV, you said you were just going to listen. You can jump in any time you want to. KC5OZT, Carolyn, go ahead. Some of them is made up of just a few main characters, and uh, uh, Peter Graves for one, and his wife supporting him for one, and uh, and going right along with the FBI stuff of all chasing him. That was sort of un real, you know, uh, but, uh, uh, and then, uh, uh, but the rest of the people are just sort of, a. Uh, uh, they were just there, uh, you know, none of them really stood out, you know, uh, it's up the aliens, of course, but, uh, uh, I don't know, it was just, uh, uh, I said, it might have been just simply put together just to make a few bucks, you know, and, but, uh, not really caring how accurate or that it could be made better, I don't know, but, uh, uh, there were a few that stood out, uh, but uh, not many. Case of OZT. All right, uh, Camp on TSK, Burl, go ahead. Well, I would say that. Uh, uh, you know, the strangest thing when the movie started, they had this T-38 uh, model plane that was just going around in a circle, and I just thought, you know, the, this has got to be the worst movie. You know, it it, it just didn't, uh, uh, you wouldn't expect that for, you know, the 1950s. I'm, I'm sure we've seen a lot better uh, uh, movies. You know, plane crashes, and they don't investigate the accident. Uh, you know, and the pilot walks away. Um, you know, that's, um, you know, really strange. And, and and no one questions anything. It, it's like, you know, they they wrote the, the plot, and it was like, oh, let's not worry about the details. Um, that's all I've got for right now. I can't find PSK back to that. Yes, Billy. Yeah, I looked on IMDb, and the music is credited to Manuel Kompinski, who is uh, an English-born composer, uh, and it says he was regarded as one of the great violinists of the 20th century, as well as a good conductor and a superb teacher. Uh, his students included conductor Michael Pilson Thomas and Glenn Dictoro, who was concertmaster of the New York Philharmonic, uh, and with his brother Alec Kompinski on cello and sister Sarah on piano, they formed the Kompinski Trio, which was one of the most respected and acclaimed chamber music ensembles in the U.S. Uh, in the 1920s through the 1940s. 
Uh, it also says that he worked with W. Lee Wilder on uh, this film, Killers from Space, and The Snow Creature and the thriller The Big Bluff. Um, and then in the late 50s, he was called to testify in one of the last rounds of hearings of the House Committee on Un-American Activities and refused to answer questions uh, pleading the fifth, and he was subsequently dismissed by Universal. But he worked in the music department during the 50s and 60s, uh, and you know, there was lots of good movies put out. Uh, he's listed on the music department on movies such as Around the World in 80 Days and The Great Escape, among others. Um, but it says from the 60s to the 80s, his music activities were confined to the classical field, principally as a teacher, and he died in 1989 at the age of 88. So that is on Fandango.com, the biography of Manuel Kempinski, and he's listed on IMDb as the music uh, for this film. Uh, so just wanted to throw that out there. And uh, let me reset, and I'll put out some, just a short bit of other information. Hang on a sec. Another question that had popped up a minute ago was, was Billy Wilder well-known at the time of this film? Well, in 1950, uh, Billy Wilder had done Sunset Boulevard, which had won three Academy Awards in 1951. Uh, it won for Best Writing Story and Screenplay, Best Art Direction, and Best Music. And then in 1954, uh, Billy Wilder had done Sabrina, which won uh, Academy Award for Best Costume Design in 1955. So yeah, I would say yes. Uh, at the time that this film was made, Killers from Space, uh, Billy Wilder was an Academy Award winning director and writer, uh, and obviously his brother was not. But uh, yes, Billy Wilder was famous at the time that this film was made. So I just wanted to throw that information out there. So with that, I don't have any other comments uh, until we get to some other things. So this is KFI's PBS, back to now. Well, thanks for that information. Um, I know, knew that Bill Wilder was a, was a big deal, but I didn't know how early. I guess his brother is coattailing on his career, maybe. Uh, I don't know if... Uh, this Wilder ever did anything significant, or if maybe this was his best work? I don't know. Hey, KG5BZWJ, go ahead. This is KG5BZW. Um, Carrie was, yeah, um, Peter Graves, uh, Probably, uh, you, uh, it, it, it's, I want to say something kind of positive about this film in some aspect, because for whatever reason, unlike some movies that we've seen, even though this film's all over the place, it's, I don't know, it, maybe it's just my movie or something, it didn't annoy me like some films. Um... Of course I did. I I knew to uh, to take a break in the middle of it. <laughs> um, so, gosh, I don't know what to say because there just wasn't that much I can really I really even desire to to remember. Um, I, I guess there's other aspects of, of the film I'm kind of more interested in commenting on. So. Uh, the, the aliens were dull. The um, even Graves' character wasn't exactly. I I don't know what else to say, but uh, it. <laughs> I really don't know what to say. In fact, I'm, I just I think I should just. Uh, <laughs> I'm just handing it over. Next uh, topic, KG5 BCW. Well, I looked up Lee Wilder. He did a ton of stuff. Uh, before this, he did a bunch of shorts. 
there's not anything in here I've ever heard of, but he was directing movies way up into the late 60s, including something called The Man Without a Body, Man Fish, The Snow Creature, Bluebeards, Ten Honeymoons. Uh, sure, they're very memorable, but I've never heard of any of them. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it would, um, it would take me a long time to get tired of watching fear movies, um, but this kind of tried my patience in that regard. It's just so stupid, but he made some other... Um, movies, uh, about the same time, It Conquered the World, and, um, Red Planet Mars. I think we did that as one of our Afterglow movies, did we not, Tom? Uh, affirmative, uh, I can't remember, it was kind of forgettable, but yes, we, yes, we saw that film, um. Uh, I think that's what, the one where the guy had the secret radio and was t talking to Martians, and um, uh, then it, it didn't go well. But uh, but that's Peter Graves in that movie. And this movie, the wife is just completely annoying, as women often are in the science fiction movies. Um, and uh, the aliens were just beyond stupid. And if I'm not mistaken, didn't they offer the Peter Gray's character a chance to live if he cooperate? Like, sure, how would you like to be the only human left in the universe? Yeah, that's a deal. So, it's so much not believable. All right, um, any more check-ins? Money or 
they were smart enough, I would go with they didn't have enough money, that this was making these blasting noises in the background, which actually kind of uh, worked in the movie's favor. That was the only thing. Let me reset. So I thought that was kind of interesting, and it had kind of this mesmerizing sound, this insidious part to it. I think that that was probably a complete accident, because I don't think this film actually planned anything out in the future. But it did work. I thought, too, that the underground subterranean level thing actually was semi-convincing. What are you going to do with, you know, partially lit everything in the process? But it, it, it seemed reasonable. What threw it out, what was the 555-1212 five, 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 one, two, one, two of this thing? was as soon as they got all the insects and the lizards and all the stock footage going on and doing nothing because there's no way that stock footage can have an interactive thing with Peter Graves. Even having an interactive experience with Peter Graves probably isn't going to happen. If you saw Mission Impossible, possible, you will note that he never interacted with anybody except when he went on vacation and they took him hostage. But that's the only episode. And I think it was by lizards. Uh, back to you, that control. Ding, 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 KE5ICX. Oh, you do that music so well. W5EVV, David, go ahead. Well, there were some effects in this movie, but I found none of them to be special. However, <laughs> the, uh, the, the lengthy, lengthy, lengthy scenes of the insects and, and all of their uh, voracious uh, <laughs> uh, uh, activities, just, uh, I had to look up what that reminded me of. The Ludo the Ludovico technique. It is aversion therapy, which was used in a clockwork orange. This is what uh, uh, the main character was watching as his eyes were being pried open. Uh, Malcolm McDowell. That's what I think it was, at least, because it was it was totally unpleasant and went on totally too long. Uh, but that was, I guess, the main special effects was magnified insects and lizards behaving badly. W5EBB. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't think that was a real sound plan. Let's grow these big creatures and uh, see if they'll eat all the humans. Well, they'll eat each other and all the crops and they'll destroy everything. I, I just don't think it was a real good idea myself. But yeah, this... Aversion therapy. I think that's what we do every Saturday night. We watch something that's just so offensive and we can't take our eyes off of it. It's like a train wreck. All right, next. Um, hmm, let's see. I've lost my place. Um, KC5OZT. Carolyn. Well, it seems a lot of some of the effects were stock footage, uh, like the bomb going off, or even the, I can remember seeing pictures of the, like the soldiers watching, and it might not have been the same pictures and other stuff over the years, but, and, uh, all that equipment, you know, when they were at the power plant and stuff, and No, I didn't really explain any of it, uh, but, uh, and yeah, I know, the insects were gross, but, uh, um, the final explosion, uh, that, uh, just, it seemed odd that it just happened to be where they could run to the window and see it, you know, uh, 
but uh, and I have to admit there wasn't. Well, there were some car chases and st stuff, but uh, I don't know why you consider that special effects. Kate's uh, by Bose Ed T. Okay, Burl, KF5 TSK, go ahead. Oh, uh, this is KF5 TSK. Well, one of the other things that I thought was uh, unusual is uh, Doug breaks into the uh, vault at the Air Force uh, and he drops his pipe. You know, it's like, who, who does that? I mean, uh, you know, you're going in to get something and, and uh, you know, and your pipe falls out of your pocket. Uh, and and what did he expect to get out of the vault? The aliens seemed to know everything. They knew how much. The only thing they didn't know is when was going to be the next explosion. Uh, uh, but then again, it, this was probably uh, uh, right in the plot by committee. Can't find TSK back to that. Billy, KF5PS. Yeah, I wouldn't call these special effects. I agree with the comment. They're effects, but they're not special. You know, you got blow-ups of the stock footage of the of the animals to make them look large, but. Uh, and yeah, you've got some model airplanes, but you know, it definitely was nothing, you know, wowing about that. Um, I'm enjoying the comments. <laughs> uh, the Blue Man Group comment had me rolling. It's like, yes, totally see that with these guys. Um, and now every time I think of the Blue Man Group, I'm going to be thinking of these guys too, the Googly Eye Group. So. Uh, and Tom, yes, your musical renderings are spot on, uh, and uh, <laughs> much better. You, you just, need, Tom, you need to score this film uh, just with your da dink, da dink, da dinks. That I'm, I'm loving that. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I don't think that there's to me nothing stands out as special effects. Uh, for this film. So with that, I'll return it to you. This is KF5 PDF. Back to now. KG5BZWT, uh, did you find anything special about these, the uh, special effects? KG5BZW here. Um, I'm going to make the argument that besides Peter Graves being, I don't know, Peter Graves. <laughs> uh, I, I actually thought, um, and this is, you, please understand the scale here. Uh, I think the the visual effects were maybe the best, <laughs> most rememberable parts of it. Uh, and I, I, the only reason I can say that is I actually remember a few that nobody actually even commented on. Uh, but well, some of them did, but. So we have the the I'm kind of curious where the special effect for you know the the light came the light that you know locked the aircraft controls. Uh, I thought that was actually kind of convincing for you know movie logic. It, it didn't seem that bad. Uh, the flight uh, models were uh, that was kind of horrible, but it, it was you know whatever. The, the fly the model aircraft that they were used to kind of fly and shows up that was whatever. The floating eyes in the middle of nowhere, simple, very simple effect, but it was, I thought it actually worked to uh, a good degree for me. It, I, I I really like that. Um, and like I said, it's like hey, they didn't do anything with that. Um, so all right. And then I don't remember. There's lots of drama, drama, drama. Uh, so Peter Graves uh, has the exposition when they give it the in injection. 
All right. So, you know, you got the, the, the I, I think of those guys as, as Simpson characters. Mark, Matt, Matt Gronig, like, got his inspiration for uh, uh, Simpsons and Futurama, the facial design from there. Now, now really, I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> that's, literally, that's the first, from, I, that was what I got from uh, first seeing uh, even, you know, uh, not the film, but, you know, stuff from there. Uh, let me reset just because. Okay, so after that, you got the Jacob's Ladder constant. I I, I thought the the um, the little uh, television kind of interface, flat screen TV, whatever you want to call it, was uh, how they handled that uh, projection system, whatever it is. I thought that was kind of cool. The insects that big were the in, the small critters that were big and horrible and all. I almost wondered if I had missed a seg segment of the film and and they were going to reveal to me that, uh, oh, you can shrunk two, three inches tall. <laughs> That's why you can never escape until we resize you or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that makes more sense in this film. Uh, um, and then I don't know. I don't remember much. After that, of course, I, I didn't quite see the whole film. I, I like they took footage from inside of what looked like some an actual power plant or something. That was convincing. Um, and then, yeah, that's when I, when I just stopped. So, like I said, I can remember that bit, those bits. So, uh, that's what's good to me, and that's why I remember. So, uh <laughs> That's all I remember. Okay, you buy BCW. Back to net. Thanks, Jay. This is WB50ZL. Um, I don't think the big eyes in space were worse than those big brains. You know, we've really seen some some awful turkeys of movies. Um. Special effects. I don't know why they didn't find some stock footage of UFOs and pretend that these aliens came down on these UFOs. I don't remember seeing a spacecraft that they had. They just kind of showed up in the uh, in the caves uh, and with all this equipment and all this power and they knew everything and uh, had this great plan. But I I would have wanted to see some maybe some spaceship fights or something. So, uh, all right, we have kind of reached the end of the road, but if anybody has any more comments, just jump in and let us know what you have to say about this. E5 ICX. K-E-5-I-C-X. Go ahead. Alright, um, something I'll mention is uh, I've transitioned into a different job. And I used to be out in the field doing lots of stuff. Now I'm doing video and audio and uh, I'm involved with training and all of that. And I work with a guy. Uh, who is a videographer type person. He does all these things to try and set stuff up. And he spends a lot of time making sure that the audio sounds consistent from one scene to another and one uh, delivery to another. And I think that I, I, I understand how that's important, but I didn't realize how important it is. Uh, having to do with echoes and background and it, what does the fidelity sound like. Now, by no means are we professionals. We're probably way below even this movie that we watched, except for one thing. And that is, is that when you have a studio, when you have a place where you're trying to do audio, 
hard walls, hard floors, um, uh, high ceilings all create echo. This movie is loaded with that. It is terrible. The sound is the worst ever. You can put Peter Graves in anything, and he sounds like he's in a freaking bottle somewhere. Don't do that. you got to find a way to make this stuff work. And you got to do it where the sound is reasonable. And it's not in this film. So uh, if there's any takeaway from this film, I thought the audio was the worst ever. Even Plan 9 from Outer Space had better audio. Of course, the plot was better, too. That's it from me. Echo, echo, echo. K-E-5-I-C-X-X-X-X-X-X. Okay, um, I may have skipped Burl in the last rotation, K-F-5-T-S-K. Did I skip you, and if so, I'm sorry? Uh, this is K-F-5-T-S-K. I would say one other thing that, uh, I kind of like their, uh, costumes, uh, the masks. You know, for 1950s, um, uh, they look real, they look good to me, and uh, uh, the other thing was that they were consistent, so uh, that was about the only thing about the movie that seemed to, you know, really be impressive to me. Everything else seemed to be uh, either old, out of place, or something they just sort of threw together. Can't find TSK back to net. I kind of feel like this is a movie that just should not have been made. It's like sometimes people get ideas and they just keep going with it because they started with it. And at some point you maybe need to back away and say, you know, maybe this isn't the best idea. Um, They obviously didn't invest a whole lot of money in it or time. Uh, I would love to know what they made on it and maybe, maybe, you know, maybe turn to profit. I don't know. People were not so um, discerning about movies in the early 50s as they were later on. Okay, anybody else have a comment? W5EBB. W5EBB. Well, I just wanted to second the comment that this does look a lot like uh, Matt uh, Gronick's uh, uh, characters in his early cartoons and in The Simpsons. And Marge's hair looks like one of those giant lizards got wrapped up inside of a wig or something, you know, some kind of a, a hybrid, I don't know. But, uh, you know, you see some some elements in the, in the caricature of the eyes and, and, and that sort of thing. And I did find one thing that's somewhat minusculely redeeming. Uh, I was looking at a picture uh, from the set of the, uh, of the power plant where they had the big you know, kind of semicircular tube that uh, uh, under which uh, Peter Graves is ducking. And just to the left of that, it looks like a piece of armor from the back of a Stormtrooper costume, which I immediately thought, uh, you know, added some redemption to this movie. W5EBB. The Stormtrooper's time machine. All right, who else? Midnight. I wouldn't have thought we would have uh, dragged this thing out that long. Um, but this thing is a turkey, but I say that we give it uh, um, a dispensation for Thanksgiving. Um, it's just too too ugly to kill it, so we're going to let it ride. Any more comments before we shut it down? delightful, wonderful film have you selected for next week?
right, this is KE5ICX. Uh, our movie for next week will be, are you ready for this? Solo, a Star Wars story. We're going to the movie tomorrow if you're interested in going. Uh, Sinmark 17, I think it's 17. Maybe, I don't know. Whatever, 635 and 35. We're going to the 1230 performance. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to go ahead and watch this film. These are, this is reserved seating, therefore you may or may not be able to sit with uh, other fellow aficionados of fine films like what we're doing right now. But afterwards, we'll go meet out in the lobby and then go eat somewhere. Uh, there's plenty of restaurants nearby. So Solo, A Star Wars Story is what the field trip will be tomorrow. And then, with spoilers, the following Saturday, we'll talk about this fine film. So uh, I know it'll be a limited group, but we can expand it on Star Wars and these uh, analog, uh, what is it, uh, single story things. Uh, we can talk about that. In any case, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about Star Wars next week. We'll be watching Solo, A Star Wars Story tomorrow. This is KE5ICX. All right, great. All right, we're going to close this net. It's uh, 2350. And thank you all for participating. That's wonderful comments and, and uh, very funny comments. And I really appreciate all your insight. This is WB5OZL.